Okay, so to fill you in a little bit, what uh, we did in the previous time, we talked a little bit about Shanti Deva's biography, which is quite interesting, but I won't tell it again right now. <laughs> um, and then we talk, it talked about the benefits of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the aspiration for full awakening, for the benefit of all beings. So we talked about the benefits of that. Then we talked about revealing our faults, our negativities, and purifying our mind. We also uh, talked about how to generate the bodhicitta, that awakening mind, and uh, in order to engage in the bodhisattva practices. Then we talked about developing conscientiousness, in other words, really cherishing ethical conduct and how to refine our behavior. And then we also talked about uh, generating in introspective awareness, a mind that constantly checks up what are we saying and doing and thinking and feeling. And then we started on the chapter called Patience or Fortitude. The old translation of this term, uh, Kashanti, is patience. But I don't like that term very much as a translation because I don't know about you, but when I hear be patient, I think of waiting for somebody. <laughs> and that's not at all what this Bodhi pra Bodhisattva practice is. It isn't about waiting for somebody. It's about have it, how to develop a strong mind inside yourself. And so that's why I feel that the term fortitude is a better translation you know, for this word, because fortitude, you know, you have some inner strength, you can bear difficulties, you aren't easily overwhelmed and you don't crumble, okay? So, you no, know, we have to develop fortitude in our lives because there's adversity, isn't there? Whether we're an ordinary being or a bodhisattva, a holy being, there's adversity, and there's difficulty, there's suffering, there's people who get angry at us, there's the difficulties of practicing the Dharma. So we have to cultivate a mind of inner strength. So that's what this chapter's about. And in the section we're, that we're talking about now in this chapter, it's about uh, how to deal with anger. In other words, when people are nasty to you, when they don't do what you want, yeah, when they do what you don't want, when they aren't cooperative, and so on and so forth, how do we build up our own inner strength in those situations? Okay, it's a good question, isn't it? Because we confront this kind of uh, situation very often in our lives. We're Things just aren't going the way we want them to. Yeah, we get blamed for thing, for wrongs that we didn't do. Yeah. I mean, of course, we're always innocent. We never did do any of the things people accuse us of doing, do we? Yeah, we're always nice, cooperative, wonderful people. And they, you know, being jerks, uh, you accuse us of things that we didn't do, right? Okay, and then we have to put up with them. Oh my God, this idiot. Yeah. So, how are we going to deal with our own internal anger and agitation in these kinds of situations? So that's going to be our topic for this week. Okay? So in the handout you have, um, we're going to be on verse... 39, and I don't have the same handout you have. I think you may have a different translation than mine. I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, if you have a different translation, just bear with me. Um, 
You know, different translators do it different ways. Okay, so the section that we're going to be talking about now is uh, stopping the cause of the anger. Okay, so verse 39 reads, even if it were the nature of the childish to cause harm to other beings, it would still be incorrect to be angry with them, for this would be like begrudging fire for having the nature to burn. Okay, so here it talks, if it were the nature of the childish. Now, we don't like to think that we're childish beings, but sorry to tell you, we're included in the term childish here, okay? Because the childish is somebody who doesn't really know what to practice in order to create the causes for happiness, what to abandon in order to avoid the causes of suffering, okay? Childish always refers to, also refers to somebody who's very easily overwhelmed by their emotions. Okay. So sometimes we're the childish people. Sometimes we're working with somebody who's childish. So here in this context, we're, you know, working with somebody who's childish. So even if it were the nature of this other person who's as childish being to cause harm to others, okay? In other words, if... Um, if anger is the nature of that sentient being, or being uncooperative is the nature of that sentient being, then it's still incorrect to be angry with them, for this would be like begrudging fire for having the nature to burn. Okay? So if it's the nature of something, you don't get mad at it for being what it is. Yeah, the nature of fire is to burn. We don't get mad at fire for having the nature to burn because that's just its nature, right? Okay, so if it's the nature of the childish to get angry and do obnoxious things, then there's no use getting mad at them because that's their nature. You see what I'm getting at? Okay, so think of your colleague, your boss. I've, I've come to the conclusion that most Singaporeans don't like their boss or their colleagues. Yeah, because almost every question I get at the end of the sessions, my boss, blah, 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 my colleague, blah, 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 blah. Okay, sometimes it's my family member, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> So even if it were this person's nature to be obnoxious, uncooperative, then no use getting mad at them because that's just the way they are. Okay? On the contrary, verse 40 says, and even if the fault were temporary in those who are by nature reliable, it would still be incorrect to be angry for this would be like begrudging space for allowing smoke to arise in it. Okay, so even if the fault, even if this person's behavior were something temporary, were, you know, were not the nature of the person, just something that temporarily was added on, if that were the case, you know, and this person were actually much more reliable and cooperative and they just had this minor fluke that happened at this time, if that were the case, it would still be incorrect to be angry because that would be like begrudging space for allowing smoke to arise in it. So smoke is not the nature of space, is it? Yeah, they're different natures. When smoke comes into space, do you get upset with the space for the fact that smoke came into it? No. Yeah, because they're, they're two different things. The smoke just came temporarily into that space. It's going to go away. Okay, so these two verses are really shooting down 
our rationale for getting mad at people because they're saying if this person's nature is to be obnoxious and co uncooperative no reason to get mad at them because that's their nature like the nature of fire is to burn if on the other hand this fault is temporary then also there's no reason to get mad at them because it's temporary like smoke coming into space so either way it doesn't make sense to get mad at somebody else now what do you think of that do you think that makes sense do you think that's true or is your mind saying but 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 you don't understand this guy really is <sighs> my anger is justified yeah. And that's the way we often feel, you know. My anger is justified. Anybody in their right mind would be angry if they experienced this. Yeah, that's the way we feel. You know, any reasonable person would be totally over the top furious. Except, is that true? Is everybody mad at the same things we're mad at? No. Why is it that, no, that not everybody's mad at the same things we're mad at? Well, it must be because they're stupid. <laughs> well, no, not exactly. Yeah. Why is it that not everybody gets mad at what we get mad at, and we don't get mad at what they get mad at? Why is that? Let me give you an example. Maybe then you can tell me why. Let's imagine I have my friend Sandy here, okay? So my friend Sandy's sitting here. And somebody walks in the room and says, San and looks at Sandy and says, Sandy, you are such a jerk. I gave you some responsibility. You didn't fulfill it. I was counting on you to do something. You didn't do it. I'm really disappointed in you. You failed. You're just a disaster. And says that to my friend Sandy. Okay. So my friend Sandy is going to get really upset. Yeah. Maybe she cries. Maybe she gets angry. You know, maybe she screams at somebody. But she's really, really upset. And I look at Sandy and I say, look, calm down, chill out. You know, this guy who came in and laid all that stuff on you, he's just venting. Yeah, he's just projecting stuff on you. He's just venting his own dissatisfaction. You don't need to get upset. You don't need to take it personally. Okay? Isn't that what you would say to your friend? If somebody, you know, was talk was criticizing your friend like, like that, yeah, wouldn't you try and, you know, say, look, don't take it personally. That guy's just mouthing off. Okay. Right. Okay. We agree on that part. Now, let's say that same person walks in the room, instead of looking at Sandy, looks at me, and says, "Children, you're such a jerk." I gave you some responsibility. You didn't do it. I was counting on you. You didn't come, you know, uh, stand by me and do this. And I was left in the lurch. And you're just a disaster. And somebody's looking at me, says the exact same words that they said to Sandy, except now they're saying it to me. Then what? What's going to happen? Who do you think you're talking to? I didn't do that. People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Why are you speaking to me like that? I didn't do that. Mind your own business. Right? Yeah? We get angry. We attack back. We get defensive. 
yeah or we we explain ourselves well you didn't understand i didn't really mean to do it it was an accident i did it because i thought it was going to be the right thing and that you would be actually be happy and you know it's a complete misunderstanding so please don't be mad at me okay if somebody says the same words that they would say to sandy to me we have something really serious going on here Okay, close to a natural, a national disaster. Yeah, forget the war in Syria. Yeah, forget what what's going on in Thailand and Ukraine right now. Somebody insulting me and accusing me of something I didn't do is much more serious than all of that. And I'm going to defend myself and get angry at this person. Now, what's the difference? This per whether this person said the exact same words to Sandy or those words to me. What's the difference? The words aren't any different. It's who they say the words to. If somebody criticizes somebody else, uh, don't worry about it, don't take it too seriously. Somebody criticizes me, big problem. No one can talk to me this way. Okay. So, you know, why is it that we get angry about these things? This is our self-centered mind, isn't it? Yeah, somebody criticizes somebody else, no problem, don't get upset. Somebody criticizes me, my self-centered mind says, no, that is not legitimate. Nobody in this universe is allowed to do that. Okay. And the only difference is because it's me. Okay. So here we see exactly how and why our own self-centered thought, our own self-concern, our self-preoccupation is involved in so many of our problems with others. Mm -hmm. This making some sense to you? So instead of thinking our self-centered thought is so wonderful and is our deep friend, we should really recognize it for what it is, that it's a big troublemaker. Hmm? Okay, let's go on to verse 41. Oh, this verse is really nice. Okay. If I become angry with the wielder, okay, so this, let me, the situation for, for this verse, verse 41, is somebody has a stick and they're beating you with a stick. Okay, that's the the situation. So if I become angry with the wielder, the person who's holding the stick, although I am actually harmed by the stick, then since the perpetrator too is secondary, being in turn incited by hatred, I should be angry with the hatred instead. Okay. In other words, okay, the stick is the thing that is directly harming me, okay? If I don't get mad at the stick, which is the thing that is directly harming me, but instead I get mad at the person who's holding the stick, who's wielding the stick, because that person is indirectly harming me, okay? Yeah, which is what we do. We don't get, you don't get mad at the stick, do you? You get mad at the person. But then why should we get mad? We get mad at the person because the person is controlling the stick. But take it another step back. That person is also under the control of their own hatred, their own anger. So they're not acting like a free agent. 
So shouldn't I be angry at their hatred? Because that's what's controlling the person. Do you get what I mean? The stick is what's directly harming us. We don't get mad at the stick. We get mad at the person because the person's controlling the stick. But the person himself is being controlled by his own mental afflictions, especially his own angry, anger and hatred. So we should get mad, actually, at that person's anger and hatred, shouldn't we? Because that's the, the real enemy that's making the person do it. Okay, think about that. You know, the person isn't harming us under their own power. They're harming us under the power of their anger. So how can we mad, be mad at the person when the person's not acting like a free agent or the person isn't a free agent? Okay, so try, you know, these methods that we're describing now, they're very interesting. You know, to try and think about this in relationship to people you're angry at. Yeah. And try, play, play with it. Try and think this way about situations that you've encountered in your life. And in this way, change your mind. And it'll help you a lot to let go of the anger. Okay. Verse 42 starts another section that's uh, about contemplating one's misdeeds when the undesirable happens. So verse 42 reads, Previously I must have caused similar harm to other sentient beings. Therefore, it is right for this harm to be returned to me who caused injury to others. Okay. So previously I must have caused similar harm to other sentient beings. In other words, if I'm suffering, somebody's doing something to me that's making me suffering, suffer, my experience of suffering doesn't come about causelessly. And it doesn't come about from discordant causes. In other words, from things that don't have the ability to cause my suffering. Okay. So my suffering comes about by a cause. We call it a concordant cause. In other words, something that has the ability to cause my suffering. And what is that? My own negative karma. Okay. So why am I suffering? Because I must have caused previously similar harm to other sentient beings. In other words, it's the boomerang effect. You know, you throw a boomerang out and it comes back and hits us. Yeah. So it's, they also have a, 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 a slang expression, what goes around comes around. In other words, whatever you do to others comes around and you're going to experience it. So if we're miserable, okay, it, why are we getting angry when the real cause of us experiencing this is our own non-virtue. Why are we blaming the other person? Why are we saying it's unfair? Why are we saying this shouldn't happen? When we actually are the ones that created the cause for it. And if we hadn't had created the cause, this wouldn't have been happening right now. Okay, think about it. Yeah. Somebody criticizes us. We all go, ah, how come you're criticizing me? I didn't do anything. This isn't fair. It's somebody else's fault. You should criticize them. That's how we always react. But why is it that we're getting criticized? It's the boomerang effect because we criticize other people. It's just coming back to us. Why are we surprised? Why are we angry? We're the one who started the whole cycle. Okay, so in that kind of situation, we have to recognize that and let go of our anger and instead learn from our experience. In other words, if we don't like what's happening to us, we have to stop creating the cause for that. 
if we don't like people criticizing us, we have to stop criticizing them. Okay? Think about it. I don't know about you, but I criticize somebody almost every day. Do you criticize people daily, on a daily basis? You know, saying some nasty kind of thing, pointing out somebody's fault. Very easy to do, isn't it? Yeah, I do it not once a day, many times a day. Oh, that person, why do they do this? They should do that. Oh, that person, they're not thinking properly. You know, what they're doing is rather stupid. Well, all the time, kind of critical remarks. Every day. Yeah. So you would think with criticizing people every day that I would get criticized every day. But I don't get criticized every day, just once in a while. Do you get criticized every day? Do you criticize someone every day? Yes. Does somebody criticize you every day? No. So actually, it's not fair, is it? We should get criticized more. Oh, you don't like that kind of logic. <laughs> okay. But, you know, when, when we are criticized, we're always so surprised. How can somebody criticize me? How is this happening? We're so surprised. But it's not surprising at all, considering how we talk about other people. It's very predictable. Okay, so that's what this verse is getting at. But verse 43, okay, this is a situation where somebody is harming us physically with some kind of weapon, okay? Both the weapon and my body are the causes of my suffering. Since the other gave rise to the weapon and I to the body, with whom should I be angry? Okay. So when it says both the weapon and my body are the causes of my suffering, it means that if somebody is beating me, okay, the weapon is part of my suffering, but my having a body is part of my suffering too. In other words, if I didn't have a body, if I didn't create the karma to have this body, then nobody could harm me with a weapon. Okay. It's like if somebody steals your car, if you didn't have the car to start with, nobody would steal it. So the, you know, the car thief contributed, you know, the high, the, you know, whatever they do to steal your car. And you contributed the car. So in this too, somebody else contributed the weapon, I contributed the body. And as a result, I suffer. Okay? So with whom should I be angry? Since it's kind of 50-50. We both contributed, contributed to my suffering. Yeah? Now you're going to say, well, that's kind of a strange way of thinking. But, you know, when you think about it, it is true. Because if we had practiced the path in a previous life, and had realized emptiness, and had created a lot of virtue, then we wouldn't have taken this body that gets old and sick and dies. And if we hadn't taken this polluted body, then there would, nobody could beat it and cause us harm. So aren't we responsible for having a body? Yeah. You're going to say, no, it's my mom and dad's fault. Well, not actually. You know, your mom and dad contributed. Yeah. But we were the ones, we were the sentient beings who created the karma that was attracted to be reborn in this body. So yeah, we had something to do with it. Okay. Both, uh, okay. So then, um, 
Okay. Verse 44. If in blind attachment I cling to the suffering abscess of a human form, which cannot bear to be touched, with whom should I be angry when it is hurt? Okay. In other words, if I'm attached to this body and I cling to this body, which is like a suffering abscess, okay? So here, you know, Shanti Deva is saying, look at what your body is. Our body by nature is so sensitive to any kind of pain. It doesn't like to be touched here, it doesn't like to be hit there, it experiences this discomfort, okay? And, you know, is that true? Is, is your body uncomfortable a lot? Yeah? Does your body, you know, is your body in the nature of being uncomfortable and sometimes being painful? It is, isn't it? You're looking at me like, oh, she's stupid. Yeah. Body is beautiful. Body is the vehicle for happiness. Look at your own experience. Sure, you get some pleasure from your body. But look at what you have to do all day to keep your body comfortable. Yeah, taking care of this body takes a lot of time. We have to feed it because otherwise it's, it's hungry. We have to drink things because otherwise it's thirsty. We have to set the thermometer, put the air con on because otherwise the body's too hard, hot. We have to buy a bed because if we sleep on the floor, the body's uncomfortable. You know, you have to get, find a seat on the bus because otherwise the body's uncomfortable standing up. You have to put a sweater on because otherwise the body's too cold. You have to take your sweater off because otherwise the body's too hot. You know, this body, it's, is, it's not always so cooperative. Yeah. So that's what Shanti Devas getting at here. If I cling with blind attachment to this form, which in some ways is like a suffering abscess because our body is never completely comfortable, yeah, then whom should I be angry when this body is hurt? Yeah, if I cling to this body and I created the causes for it, why do I get angry at other people when it's hurt? Yeah, I need to stop creating the causes for this body and I need to stop being attached to it. Yeah, and then if somebody does something to it, okay, no big problem. Okay, I mean, think about it. If, if somebody comes and hits, you know, Sandy's out there, this is my poor friend, Sandy, you know, and somebody comes up and punches Sandy, I don't get hurt. Yeah. Oh, too bad Sandy got punched, but, you know, it's not such a big deal. Somebody punches me, it's a very big deal. I got hurt. But who took my body? My own mind took it. My own mind created the cause for it. Okay, so no sense blaming anybody else. Verse 43, it is the fault of the childish that they are hurt. For although they do not wish to suffer, they are greatly attached to its causes. So why should they be angry with others? Okay. So it's the fault of the childish that they are hurt. Here we're the childish beings, okay? We don't understand what to practice and abandon on the path. Because although we childish beings, we don't wish pain, we only wish happiness, we are greatly attached to the causes of suffering, yeah? Our daily life behavior, we so easily create the cause of suffering. 
Now, even today, think about it. Yeah. Did you tell the truth in every single thing you said today? Or did you create a little bit of non-virtue of speech through kind of delicately mm, readjusting the truth? Of course, for the benefit of some, somebody else. Yeah. We're not really lying. Okay. Yeah. Did, did you say something mean about somebody else today? Or did you rejoice in somebody else, hearing somebody criticize another person? Yeah. Did you maybe stir up a little conflict and turn some people against each other? Yeah. Or maybe did you gossip today? Hey, look at, did you hear what so-and-so's doing? Look at that. Can you believe it? Did you see what so-and-so bought? Wow, look at that car. I wonder how they got so much money to buy that car. Hmm. You know? Okay, we talk a lot about people behind their back. And did you get mad at somebody today and maybe plot your revenge? Okay, so, you know, on a daily basis, it's like we want to be happy but with our actions, it's like we're totally dedicated to creating the cause of suffering. It's a sad situation. It's a situation that, that's worthy of compassion. So Shanti Deva says, why should they be attached with, uh, uh, angry with others? Yeah, so if we create the cause, this negative karma, why are we angry with others when they harm us? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, if we don't want people to harm us, we've got to stop, start acting in better ways towards them. Hmm? Okay, is this coming through? Are you getting it? Yeah? So every time you catch yourself blaming somebody and accusing somebody. Yeah, think, I'm creating the cause to get blamed and accused. Hmm? See if thinking that changes how you're acting in the situation. Yeah. If every time somebody uh, accuses you of doing something you didn't do, think, Oh, have I ever accused somebody else of doing what they didn't do? And if the answer is yes, then tell yourself, then I don't need to get angry when somebody's doing that to me, because I created the cause. Okay, verse 46. Just like the guardians of the hell worlds and the forest of razor-sharp leaves, so is this suffering produced by my actions. With whom, therefore, should I be angry? Okay, so the guardians and the hell worlds and the forest of razor-sharp leaves. This is a, refers to one of the hell realms where they have a tree with um, the leaves are like razors, and when you're at the bottom, you hear the voice of somebody you love saying, oh, please come and help me, please come and help me. So you think, oh, I want to go up and be with that person. So you climb that tree and you get all cut up because the leaves are made of razors. When you get to the top, the person isn't there, and you hear them calling from the bottom of the tree, oh, please come help me. Then you climb down the tree and get cut up again. Okay? So this is not because one of your relatives is doing this. This is just a karmic appearance. Okay? In other words, as a result of our own negative karma, we have these appearances of somebody, you know, screaming and calling for a help when there's nobody actually there, okay? So since all this suffering in the hell realms 
is produced by our own actions. In other words, our karma, our, our, the actions that we've done, then who should we be angry with? You know, again, you know, Shanti Deva keeps on saying, look, you're responsible for your own life. Hmm? Yeah, and that's what we're trying to learn. And I think, you know, many of you are parents. Are you trying to teach your kids to be responsible? When your kids are naughty, do you sometimes let them just experience the result? You know, they created a problem and you let them experience that result so that they'll learn, you know, that they have to be responsible. If you don't study for your test, don't cry when you don't do well. Yeah. If, if you're really mean to your friends, don't cry when your friends don't like you. In other words, you teach your kids to be responsible for their own actions. So that's essentially what Shanti Dev is saying to us. We have to be responsible. If we created the cause, no sense to blame anybody else. Okay? This doesn't mean we're bad people. Okay? It just means that sometimes we do things unwittingly because we're quite ignorant. And, you know, we need to kind of be on our toes and get our act together. Verse 47, having been instigated by my own actions, those who cause me harm come into being. If by these actions they should fall into hell, surely isn't I who am destroying them. And then verse uh, 48 and 49, I'll keep reading because this... In if, in depending upon others, I purify many transgressions by patiently accepting the harms that they cause, but in dependence upon me, they will fall into hellish pain for a very long time. So since I am causing harm to them, and they are benefiting me, why, unruly mind, do you become angry in such a mistaken manner? Okay, so what this means, verse 47, okay? So having been instigated by my own actions, those who cause me harm come into being. In other words, because I created negative karma, the people who cause me harm come into being. If I hadn't created the negative karma in a previous life, these people wouldn't be doing what they're doing to hurt me right now. And since by their having a negative motivation and doing a harmful action, they are now creating negative, action, negative karma, aren't they the ones who in the long term are suffering? And aren't I destroying them? Because they're now in the position of creating negative karma. So if we look at the situation according to verse 48, yeah, okay, somebody's harming me. It's because I created the, the cause in a previous life for, you know, by my own wrong actions for them to harm me now. So in actual fact, I'm the one who's purifying my negative karma because my own negativity is ripening. That karma is now finished. I won't experience it again. I'm not obscured by it again. So when somebody harms me, I'm actually benefiting by consuming my negative karma. But the person who's harming me is actually getting harmed because they are now the ones creating negative karma and they're gonna have to suffer in the future. Okay, you get it? So, you know, if you see it in that kind of way, then I'm the one who's benefiting, and they're the ones who are getting harmed by harming me. So why am I upset with the situation when I'm benefiting, getting benefited by consuming the karma? And the person who's harming me is creating the cause for their own suffering in the future. What reason is there for me to be angry? Yeah, 
I'm really coming out on top in this situation. Okay. Do you think you can think that way when somebody hurts you? In the very instant that that's happening, it's very difficult to remember these techniques. Yeah. But if you can, it, it really works. Yeah, it really works. Yeah, so when something, it, when we're undergoing some kind of difficult experience, if we just say to ourselves, this is due to my own negative karma, you know, don't be angry and instead rejoice that now this karma is getting con consumed, then we can actually have a happy mind even when we're experiencing pain. Yeah, because we can see it through the eyes of karma. Yeah. One of my Dharma friends was doing retreat and she got, uh, in Nepal, and she got a big uh, boil on her cheek. And boils are really kind of ugly and painful. She was walking around the monastery, and our teacher, you know, kind of greeted her and said, hello, and how are you? And she said, oh, I have this very painful boil on my cheek. And our teacher said, oh, fantastic. She's like, you know. And he explained, oh, it's very good. So much negative karma is getting purified this way. You know, you could have been born in the hell realms for 50 million eons by this negative karma. And instead, you're just having a boil and it's all getting used up by like, like that. This is really good. <laughs> huh? Okay? So you can see that if you, you know, really think deeply about how the law of cause and effect works, it really is possible to transform these situations and say, oh good, I'm facing adversity, fantastic. Yeah? Because in the end, this is just clearing away my bad karma. Okay? It's not that we wish ourselves misery. No, we never wish ourselves misery. Yeah. But when misery comes, there's ways to change the way we're thinking. Okay, so that we don't actually suffer from it. Okay, then verse 50. If my mind has the noble quality of fortitude, I shall not go to hell. Although I am protecting myself in this way, how will it be so for them? Okay. So if my, if my mind has the noble quality of fortitude, I shall not go to hell. In other words, if I think, you know, this suffering is benefiting me because I'm purifying, then I won't be born in the hell realms because that karma which would cause me to be reborn in the hell realms is now getting concerned consumed. However, for the uh, person who is harming me, it's the exact opposite, okay? And they're the ones, by harming me with an with a evil intention, you know, they're creating the cause to, to experience suffering in the future, okay? Then verse 51, the, okay? Um, so, <laughs> uh, here our mind says, well, okay, nevertheless, should I return the harm, it will not protect them either. By doing so, my conduct will deteriorate, and hence this fortitude will be destroyed. In other words, you know, in this situation, yeah, we're thinking, oh, they're harming me by consuming my negative karma, and they're creating the cause for suffering by doing something negative. So then if our mind thinks, well, I should harm them back for the harm they gave me, because in that way, I would benefit them and make their negative karma ripen by their suffering. What do you think of that logic? Are, are you getting what he's saying? If I'm saying, 
Yeah. Okay. This is good that I'm getting harm because I'm I'm uh, cr you know experiencing the result and consuming my own negative karma, and this person's creating negative karma, the cause of suffering. Then maybe you know I should retaliate for the harm they're causing me, cause them harm back because then I'll help them purify negative karma. Right? Yeah? You punch me, so I'm going to punch you back because I'm going to help you purify your negative karma. Wham, 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 wham. Aren't you happy with me? I'm helping you purify. Wham, wham. <laughs> okay. So, Shanti Deva is saying, if you're thinking like this, that's not going to really help the other person because what will happen is our own conduct will degenerate and uh, you know our own fortitude will be destroyed because we'll just be getting angry and taking revenge okay and so here when he's saying my by doing so my own conduct will deteriorate there's four practices that bodhisattvas uh, really try and stick to and actually, these same four practices we find in the Vinaya, four practices that monks and nuns should always adhere to, they're really difficult, but we try. Okay? So one is when somebody's angry at us, not to return the anger. Difficult, huh? Second one is if somebody beats us, not to beat them back. Difficult. Third one, if somebody derides us and insults us, not to insult them back. Hard. Fourth one, if somebody criticizes us and it reveals our faults, not to criticize them back and reveal their faults. These are called the four ascetic practices. You know, we usually think of asceticism like very simple food and, you know, not having a comfortable environment to live in. But Buddha says, no, these are the real ascetic practices. Yeah, when somebody's angry at us, not getting angry back at them, but cultivating compassion. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, how do we do that? We recognize that that person is unhappy. They're harming me because they're unhappy, so I have compassion for them. Second one, when somebody's beating me, not to retaliate. And you think, but that's crazy. My parents always told me if somebody hits me, I hit him back. <laughs> yeah. But if we, somebody hits us and we hit them back, then what happens? Then they're going to hit us again and we're going to hit them again. And then we're going to wind up with a mess. We're all going to get hurt. Okay. So to refrain from striking back and to say, no, I'm not going to hit them back. I'm not going to use physical violence. Yeah, I'm going to try and communicate with them. Because for me, physical violence is not an appropriate way of resolving a conflict. Yeah. And when you think about it, you know, physical violence is not an appropriate way to resolve a conflict. People have done this to each other since beginningless time, but it hasn't resolved any conflicts in the long run. Yeah. So it's only by really learning to communicate with somebody else that we're going to resolve the conflict. Mm -hmm. When somebody insults us, what's the first thing we want to do? Insult them back. Isn't it? Yeah. You talk behind my back, I'm going to talk behind your back. Yeah. 
you criticize me to everybody in the office, I'm going to criticize you. No, this is an ascetic practice. I'm not going to join in that dirty behavior. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to make that person a scapegoat. I'm not going to join in creating factions in the office of different people who are fighting with each other. Yeah, I'm going to step back and refrain. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then thinking, okay, somebody insulted me, so what? Yeah? I mean, really, is it that bad if we get insulted? How does somebody else's insult harm us? It's just their words. It's just their opinion. Why should we take their insults so personally? Well, it really doesn't make much sense. You know, somebody says this, somebody says that. Yeah. The reason we get up so upset is because we think their insult is true. But if we don't believe what they say about us, then there's no reason to get angry. And if we do believe that their insult is true, there's also no reason to get angry because we should just fix our bad quality. Okay, so again, neither, no reason to get angry at the other person. Okay, and then the last one, not criticizing and revealing. When somebody criticizes us and reveals our, our faults, not doing that back to them. Yeah. In other words, not perpetuating this kind of, you know, harsh speech back and forth and everything. Just let it be, you know. Maybe you have to clarify the situation because the person understands something you did, but you clarify it, but you don't have to get mad at them and, and you know, criticize them to do that. Okay, let's see. Okay, I think this is a, uh, let's see. Okay, this is kind of a good place to pause for the, the moment. Um, maybe you have some questions or comments? Okay. You're welcome to write questions. Thank you very much, Venerable, you for your teachings. So if you have any questions for Venerable, you can either raise your hand and we will pass the mic to you, or you can write the questions on a piece of paper and pass it to our volunteers. Does anyone here need paper, pen and paper? Or do you prefer to just uh, speak from the mic? Just raise your hands. Any questions from the ground? Yeah. This is really your time to ask questions because after the talk, I'm not able to answer personal questions. And so if you have questions, yes. not that you should reveal your personal questions now, but you can ask a general question about things if you like. Yeah. Could you please stand up? Oh, okay. Um, could you repeat the four, just run them through so that I could get them all in okay, the right order? Okay, the four Thank set you. of practices. Okay, so not when somebody is angry at us, not getting angry back at them, not returning the angry anger. When somebody hits us, not striking them back. Third, when somebody insults us or derides us, not to insult them back. And fourth, when somebody criticizes us or reveals our faults, not to criticize them in return and reveal their faults. Okay? Oh, 
wearable. Mm -hmm. um, you have given us so many points about a good oh, points. I can't hear you. Yeah. Hello. You have given us so many good points about our, our, our virtues and control our anger and um, angry and, and um, our baby our tempers or this. So there are so many points of it. Should we just pick up one or two and then practice on it? Because there are oh. so many of them, I don't think okay. we can remember. Okay. <laughs> just. Okay, good question. So we've gone through many, many points this evening and we haven't even finished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's many points, you know, that Shanti Deva is telling us to think about. So what do we do? Do we just pick out one and practice it? Do we pick out, do we do all of them? Okay, in your meditation, yeah, which you should do, you know, when you're not around people who are disturbing you, but just in your daily meditation, meditate on all these different points. Go through them one at a time and think about each one. And when you think about it, think of a situation that you were in and try practicing thinking like that in that situation. Okay, or imagine a situation that could happen in the future and imagine thinking like that in that situation. So you do this in your daily meditation and in that way you try all the different techniques one by one by one, thinking of different situations for each of them and you gain some familiarity with them. In the process of doing that, some of the, the uh, techniques will kind of really grab you, you know, maybe more than others. And that one, it becomes much easier for you to employ. And so you say, oh yeah, that one really makes sense to me. And so you, you, you know, really remember that one. And then in your daily life when something happens, you apply that one. Okay, like for example, for me, you know, with the ones that we went through tonight, the one that really resonates with me is I created the call, you know, if somebody's harming me or doing something I don't like, to think I created the cause through my own bad behavior in a past life. So there's no reason to get mad at this person. So for me, that, that works really well, and I've meditated on it, you know, in my daily practice a lot. And now, when things come up in my life, I can remember that, and, you know, with, before too long, my mind really calms down, because it just makes so much sense to me that, yeah, why get mad at somebody else if I created the cause? Thank you, Venerable. That gentleman over there, you have a question? Yes. Uh -huh. Please hold the mic Yeah, close to your... Yes. Yeah, I think, I think yes. it's okay now, thanks. Uh, thank you, Venerable, for the talk tonight. Uh, my, question is, uh, my question is that for someone who is not doing anything, uh, therefore he creates no cause for bad karma, I'm not sure if this thinking is correct, uh, except that he's not benefiting. He's not benefiting uh, other beings. Therefore, he's not creating virtues. Mm -hmm. But other than that, is there is that a wrong thinking? Because you know, being in, indifferent and and being a hermit or whatever. I mean, you're not creating causes for bad karma. Okay. So what what you're saying is. Somebody is not doing behavior that harms others. Yeah, he does nothing, basically, yeah. Is that? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, uh, so if you're not doing behavior that, you know, karma means action. So if we're not creating actions that are harmful to others, or we're not acting with, we're not acting with a negative motivation, yeah, then those actions are not negative karma. Yeah, so we're not creating the cause for suffering by those actions. But in a previous life, we could have done things that were negative karma. 
and in this lifetime we're experiencing the result. So that's why it could be, B people often ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, in this lifetime somebody is not doing anything really awful to others, but you know, they'll have misfortune. Why is that? Because in a previous life, they did something with a negative motivation that was harmful. Okay, so often in our life, we're experiencing the result of what we did in a previous life. Okay, similarly, yeah, we have a lot of fortune in this life. How come, you know, here we are in Singapore, we all ate today, yeah, we, we're in a peaceful country with enough to eat, with nice people, we have access to the Dharma. We're experiencing a lot of fortune today. Maybe today we didn't create so much good karma. Yeah, maybe it was a bad day for us today. But still we're experiencing the results of good karma we created in a previous life. So the thing is, you know, since we're the ones who create the causes for our experience, if we harm others now, we're creating the cause to be harmed in the future. If we're kind to others now and are generous now, we're creating the cause for happiness in the future. Okay, getting it? Yeah. Okay, there's some questions here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yesterday um, in the retreat I gave an example of, um, you know, you're trying to help your child and you're, uh, you tell your child to put their sweater on so that they don't catch cold. They put their sweater on, as soon as they go outside they take their sweater off, <laughs> you know, and then they get chilled and they get sick. So this person's saying, if this child or if this adult, you know, doesn't listen, continues with this action and constantly gets sick, why should we still help such a person? It doesn't make sense to continuously help such a person, does it? Okay, I think there's a difference between if it's a child and if it's an adult, yeah? If it's a child who is not listening to advice, you, you still continue to help the child because the child doesn't follow the advice because their thinking capability hasn't matured yet. You know, children need a lot of guidance over a long period of time. So just because the child doesn't listen to you the first time doesn't mean you completely give up. You know, you help the child mature. You teach them step by step until they can get it, okay? On the other hand, if it's an adult, yeah, and it's somebody and you're trying to, to give advice and this person is very obstinate and just won't listen and says, get off my case, yeah, you may try a second or a third time to help them, but if they're really not receptive, then it's better just to step back, yeah, and because they're going to have to learn from their own behavior. That doesn't mean that you wish them harm. It doesn't mean you slam the door in their face. You keep the door open, but you just realize that this person isn't receptive to your advice right now, and they may have to learn the hard way. But if they learn and they come and they want help afterwards to keep learning, then the door's open and you're ready to, you know, give them good advice again. Okay, then where did I put my glasses? Oh, here they are. They blended with the color of the, uh, 
of the brocade. Does envy work the same way as hatred? Mm, not real clear what the person means. Um, envy does work the same way as hatred in the sense that it through envy we create negativity and that negativity will come back on us. Okay? Envy, you know, is similar to anger and hatred in that with envy, we want to destroy other people's happiness. Yeah, and so similar with anger or hatred, we want to destroy other people's happiness. Although some people say to me, well, when I envy somebody else, I don't really want to ha destroy their happiness. I just want to be better than them, <laughs> you know, and have, I want to have that same happiness too. In fact, more than them. Yeah. So, you know, maybe in that way, sometimes we could envy somebody but not want to harm them. Yeah. Whereas other times we may envy somebody and, and want to deprive them of their happiness. Okay. Okay, so if a person is suffering uh, in, and is in some form of trouble, and I don't want to get involved at all, not even to offer a comforting word, and I remain indifferent, am I causing negative karma? Am I creating negative karma? It depends on your motivation, okay? If somebody is suffering and in trouble, and you look and you see, you know, I don't have the ability to help them. And if I try to help them, you know, it's just going to create a mess and get more people involved and it won't really solve the problem. So I'm not going to get involved because I don't, I can't really do anything of benefit. And so for that reason, you remain indifferent even though, you know, you don't wish that person any harm, then that's not negative karma. Yeah. But if the person's in trouble and you think, I'm glad they're having that problem. They harmed me. Yeah, now they're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to get involved because, pooh, I don't care about them. Anyway, I'm too lazy, I don't care. If you have that kind of attitude, yes, you're creating negative karma. Okay? Does karma affect everyone regardless of religion? Yes. You know, karma simply means our actions. And the law of karma and its effects means the actions we do and the effects that those actions bring. And that works for everybody regardless of your religion, regardless of your belief system. In the same way gravity works for everybody no matter what your religion. Yeah? Doesn't it? Uh, you, you, if you jump up, you're going to come down. That's the law of gravity. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. That's what's going to happen. So the same thing with uh, the law of karma. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, Venerable. Thank you for your talk. Um, Actually I, actually, I have a few questions. So, um, my first question is right. Um, just now, you actually talked about the four guidelines that the four guidelines that uh, the uh, monastics follow, right? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, if you adhere to these four guidelines, are you actually stopping the causes for future suffering? And actually, are you stopping like uh, say like the wheel of karma or something? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So there's those four practices that I was saying as ascetic practices not 
returning anger with anger and yeah. If you, if you practice those, those alone will not take you out of cyclic existence, but, but if you do comply with them, then you aren't, it, it's stopping a major cause of suffering, okay? Because we create a lot of suffering for ourselves by responding to anger with anger, by hitting back when somebody hits us, by insulting the person who insults us and criticizing the person who criticizes us. So we do create a lot of negative karma that way, and we stop all that suffering by stopping those actions. But to get out of the cycle of existence, we need to realize the nature of reality. Okay, we need that wisdom. Oh, then I still have like, another question. Uh, it's like, um, okay, like, uh, how do you actually prevent your advice from like, sound, turning into like, an insult? Because like, if people insult you, right, uh, you may want to try and advise them, but your advice may turn into like, an insult. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand. You're advising a colleague, and then they interpret your advice like an insult? So how do you, how do you prevent that? Oh, <laughs> so yeah. what do you do then? Then, if they see if they misinterpreted something you said, because if they did, then, you know, you just have to backtrack and explain it to them again, you know, that you're not insulting them, you, you know, you're just trying to give some advice. And you know, trying to to see what part did they misunderstand, and then explain it so that they can understand it properly. Uh, then okay. my last question is, uh, what's the difference between envy and admiration? Envy and admiration? Oh, I think big difference. Envy is somebody has something that you think is really good and you feel like you're discontent inside because you want what they have. And you may even want to take it away from them so that they don't have it. So inside your mind, you're really discontent and you want to, you know, greedily get something for yourself or angrily destroy somebody else's happiness. With admiration, you look and you say, wow, how fantastic. I really admire that person for having that quality. You know, there's a sense of rejoice and a sense of happiness in your mind at seeing somebody else's fortune or somebody else's good quality. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think this is going to be the, the last question here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this person is saying, after we, we get reborn into, as an animal or a human, we no longer feel sensations or remember in the next life. Okay, since this is the case, is it the same in hell, or do we feel sensations of being burnt in hell? Well, if you're born as an animal or as a human, you experience sensations. I mean, right now we're born as a human, we experience pain and pleasure, yeah? So whatever realm we're born into, we experience the result of our karma, either as pain or pleasure. You know, in unfortunate realms like the hell realm, we experience more pain. In fortunate realms like the, uh, the celestial realm there's, or the human realm, there's more pleasure. Okay. Good. So, we have to close now. Thank but, you. But, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Your homework. <laughs> is uh, tonight and tomorrow morning, think about some of what we talked about. And try, you know, think of situations in your life and try applying one of these methods to counteract anger that we spoke about and practice it, okay? 
So try and review what you learned and put it into practice. And then tomorrow evening, we'll continue. Yeah, this chapter, I really love this chapter because it's very, uh, very practical. Mm -hmm. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore.